Well, greetings, everyone, and welcome to the Law Hour and Editorial Review. The Law Hour is sponsored by the Gordon Law School of Isabella, Missouri. Now, the Law Hour is an educational service brought to you in the public interest. I'm your narrator, George Gordon. The Law Hour and Editorial Review is heard nationally and internationally seven days a week here in the United States and in more than 120 countries worldwide over the Internet. For more information about the Law Hour and the Editorial Review, please visit our webpage at georgegordon.org. Again, that's georgegordon.org. Now, the Law Hour and Editorial Review brings you important information about law, science, education, politics, religion, health, history, economics, news, and current events. So stay tuned for tonight's special report on the wild pigs of the Okefenokee Swamp. The story begins in North Dakota. Jedediah Smith, a very successful hunter and trapper, during the period after the Civil War, was born in 1840 down in North Carolina. By 1861, he had joined the Confederate Army, served his time, disillusioned after the war. He left the South, and he went north into the Dakota Territory and up into Canada, where he was a very successful trapper and hunter during the period from 1865 to 1900. Well, in 1899, after a successful year, he had some time on his hands and he thought, I wonder if I'm up to the wild pigs of the Okefenokee. He'd heard about them all of his life. You see, the wild pigs of the Okefenokee had gone wild back during the Revolutionary War down in the Okefenokee Swamp on the Georgia Florida border. These pigs now numbered in the thousands. They were wild. They were big. They were lean. They were mean. But more importantly, they were independent and free. Stories that would come out of the Okefenokee of people having been killed or maimed while hunting there, trying to capture these pigs or to kill one for a trophy, were numerous. So old Jed packed up his stuff, loaded it in his Studebaker wagon, and he headed south in the autumn of 1899. And he showed up on the north side of the Okefenokee Swamp in a small town about January of 1900, New Century, new opportunities, and a new adventure. Old Jed drove his team of big Belgians down Main Street, pulling his Studebaker wagon until he arrived at the general store. Having never been there before, and being new, and he went inside, and around the pot-bellied stove there were seven or eight men, some whittling, some spitting. They eyed the stranger <coughs> He went up to the owner of the store and he introduced himself and he said, I'm a trapper and I'm down here from the north country and I've heard of the wild hogs of the Okefenokee and I thought I'd come down and try my hand at trapping them. Boy, that got the interest of the men sitting around the stove. One of them, whose arm was missing from the elbow down told a story about how he'd gone out into the Okefenokee and in trying to hunt the wild hogs and he'd been attacked and they tore his arm off and ate it and he was lucky to get out with his life. Another man on a peg leg told a similar story. All of the men shook their heads in disbelief at the thought that this old trapper would go out into the swamp, especially by himself. They all agreed that nobody in his right mind would dare go out into the swamp looking for those hogs by himself, that it would take at least a hunting party of five or six. And so, after old Jed had heard the stories, he thanked them all, and he bought about five tons of corn and loaded it in the wagon, and he said, thank you, fellas, for your information, and he got directions to the swamp, and he headed on down the road. 
Well, everybody was surprised that this old trapper wouldn't listen to their warnings. And each one of them said in turn, he said, well, that old guy, he'll never come back here again. And those, those pigs out there have been wild and free for so long, they'll, they'll simply kill him, take his corn, probably kill and eat his horses, and certainly kill and eat him. Well, some time went by, <clears throat> a couple of months as a matter of fact. And one day, old Jed came driving into town, this time from the south rather than from the north. And he pulled up to the general store. Not only was everyone surprised that he had survived, but they engaged him in conversation. They wanted to know where you've been, what you've been doing, what's been your success. Old Jed never said much. But he bought another five tons of corn. He loaded it on the wagon and he hauled it out of town headed south again down toward the swamp. And well, a couple of months went by, and pretty soon uh, an old Jed comes driving back into town. Everybody inquired of him, where you been? What you been doing? In fact, by now, <clears throat> old Jed Adiah Smith had become quite a little tale of him by himself. Kind of a mystery. Kind of a story. Kind of like folklore. Who was this stranger who blew into town and and he goes down into the swamp feeding the wild hogs in the swamp? So some time went by. <clears throat> About every two months, old Jed would come back to town, buy five tons of corn, take it out into the swamp and disappear for a couple of months. He'd come back. Well, after four or five trips, one day, <clears throat> about mid-August, old Jed came back into town. And the boys at the store gathered round to inquire of him. And the the owner of the store said, Well, I suppose you need another five tons of corn. And old Jed said, No, sir. No, sir. I don't need any more corn. He said, I need to hire about 50 wagons. I've got 7,000 head of hogs penned up in the swamp. And I need to haul them all off to market. We need to haul them in. And I'm looking for a buyer. I've got about 7,000. Now, the people were just absolutely, absolutely incredulous. You know, many a man had gone into the swamp and never came back again. And here's this old trapper been going back and forth into the swamp for months. And not only did he come back, he comes back with a wild tale that he's trapped 7,000 hogs, has them all penned up, needs to hire 50 wagons to go haul them off to market. So <clears throat> the boys <clears throat> gathered around and they said, well, tell us the story. How did you trap these 7,000 hogs in the Oki Finoki? Oftentimes here at the law school, I get inquiries as to how the Roman Empire had been depreciated and taken captive, how the Egyptians, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the great empires and nations and city-states could be destroyed and taken captive. And every time I hear those requests and inquiries, I always remember old Jedediah Smith and the wild pigs of the Okefenokee. Well, old Jed said, I guess we could take a few minutes and gather around and I'll tell you how I did it. He said, first of all, when I showed up in January and you boys all told me about how dangerous these hogs were, I took your advice. I thought about that and I said, you know, if I get close to that swamp going in there by myself, those hogs down there, they're going to overwhelm me. So he said... I took your advice, I, I heeded your warning, and I didn't go into the swamp right away. I just went down to the edge of the swamp, and I put out a little corn for about two or three miles. I put out little little clumps of corn. And at first, the wild hogs, being big, lean, mean, free, and independent, and they didn't trust me, and I didn't trust them. And they didn't come out to eat that free corn either. But little by little, the younger ones would. The young ones and the very old ones. You see, these pigs had been free for nearly 150 years. These pigs were used to 
eating acorns and roots and, and snakes and mire. They'd become lean, mean, big, independent, and free. They didn't need any corn. But the corn was free. And because it was free, it was easy. And because it was free and easy, the oldest and weakest and the youngest and least experienced would come out of the swamp and partake of the free corn. Over time, more and more pigs would come out of the swamp to partake of the free corn. Within a couple of three months, all of the pigs would come out early in the morning, partake of the free corn, and then go back into the swamp and continue living their lives. After all, they were big, lean, mean, independent, and free. After a while, they got used to me feeding them at the edge of the swamp, and they knew that I meant them no harm and that I was not a threat to them. They accepted me. They knew that I wasn't there to harm them. I was just there to help them, to feed them. And so, after having won their trust, I could go into the swamp, not very far at first, just a little ways, and I could feed them inside the swamp. And then, little by little, I kept feeding them further and further into the swamp until I got to the big clearing. At the big clearing, which is about five acres, I fed them every morning and every night right there in the big clearing. Pretty soon, the pigs became less and less accustomed to feeding themselves acorns, roots, snakes, and mire. And they became more and more dependent on the free corn, especially the old ones and the young ones. But over time, all of them became totally dependent upon the free corn. They were so dependent that they couldn't find acorns, roots, snakes, and mire. And I cut their feed down. I didn't feed them twice a day. I only fed them once a day, just early in the morning. And they would all come to the big clearing. I wasn't any threat to them. After all, they could come freely, partake of the free corn, and then they could leave and go back out into the swamp and sleep. They no longer had to work. They no longer had to root out acorns and roots and snakes and mire. Well, over time, I began to work among the pigs, and so I started digging post holes around the outside of the five acres, and over time, day after day, I dug post holes and I put in my posts. And every day, the pigs would come through the posts into the clearing, and they would partake of their free corn, and then they would leave. They could see that I was no threat to them, and that every day that I fed them, they became more and more confident of me. And after all, it was no threat to their freedom. They could walk into and walk out of and through and between the, the uh, posts, totally unimpeded. Well, after I got all of the posts put into place, all the way around the clearing, I then started putting rails up. First of all, I put a rail all the way around the bottom, which was no impediment to any of them. They could just step over the rail and go in and eat their free corn. In fact, now they were so dependent upon the free corn, they would come into the, into the clearing early and they would be squealing for me to deliver the corn. They were now totally dependent upon corn, unable to root out acorns and roots and snakes and mire. All of them were totally dependent upon the corn. So as time went by, I got the first rail around, and then I put on a second rail. When I put on the second rail, some of the oldest pigs and then some of the youngest and smallest couldn't step over two rails. So I left two holes in the fence called gates. And these two gates were no threat to anybody. None of the pigs were concerned. They could go in and out of the gates or they could jump over the two rails. 
By the time I put the third, fourth, and fifth rails on, none of the pigs could jump over the rails, but all of them could go in and out of the gates. So now they became totally dependent upon the corn being fed to them every day in the morning, and they would come, all of them, into the clearing, and they would partake of the free corn. I say all of them, I really mean most of them, because there were some that were leery. Some of the wild, lean, big hogs, they would not eat the free corn. They would not come into the clearing. They would not step over the rails. They would not venture through the gates. They stayed on the outside, and they eyed me warily. I stayed away from those wild free hogs. Because now we had 7,000 tame pigs who were partaking of the corn every day. So as time progressed, I built two gates. And I hung the two gates. But I left them open. And the gates that were open, they could walk through, eat the corn, walk out. They were just as free as they'd always been. And, of course, they never saw me as being any threat to them. After all, I was just there to help. I was just there to feed, just there to take care. So as time went by, I closed one of the gates. And this caused quite a stir. The hogs now were very concerned. You could see it in their eyes. But now, being totally dependent upon the corn and unable to feed themselves, they had no choice. They had to go through the open gate into and out of the five acres so that they could feed. And so, day after day, I went through the gate. They followed me. I went around the five acres, and I put out the corn, and they fed. And then I would drive through but I didn't close the gate, and they were free, and they could walk in, and they could walk out, and they felt very confident. Well, this morning, I carried out my usual routine, and then about 6 o'clock this morning, I went in with the last of the corn, and I put the corn out for the last feeding, and all of the pigs followed me in. Well, except for the wild hogs of the Okefenokee, those that were leery, the big ones, the lean ones, the mean ones, the independent ones, the free ones, they never would go in and partake of the free corn. But all the rest of them did, and they followed me in this morning, and I made my usual rounds. And then I drove out. When I drove out this morning, I stopped my horses, and I got down off the wagon, and I went over, and I closed the gate. 